Welcome to Bangalore Revival Center, a church dedicated to loving God and serving people. Today, Pastor Priti continues to teach from the series Emmanuel with the heart for hosting God's presence in our lives. We believe this word will be a blessing to you. Today I'm going to go a little further. This is the fifth topic under this series. We'll start from the book of Esther chapter 4 and verse 7. Mordecai, the Bible says, told him him is the guy who was assisting Esther. The book of Esther is about Esther. The queen Esther, the 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 entire book is about Queen Esther. The Bible says this, that Mordecai told him, what did he tell him? that there has been a lot of planning that has been going behind the scenes to destroy the people of god to destroy the children of god told him the whole story including the exact amount that haman had promised to pay into the treasury for the destruction of the jews so so there was there was a spirit there was a person there was a family there were a people group they were not just desiring for a destruction of god's people but they were actively working towards making sure that god's people get destroyed to the extent they were willing to pay money to destroy god's people you may not understand this but the grace that you carry is so powerful is so great it's so glorious that the enemy and there are people who are who may go to whatever length required to make sure that you are destroyed you know there was a story in the bible where the 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 nation of israel and this pagan nation is in in a time of conflict they are at war and the bible says the nation the enemy nation the king of that nation you know what he did at one point he took his own son okay check this out okay the son of the king is usually the heir to the throne right right see come on see if if this king and this king is fighting it is because this king and this king both want to sustain their kingdoms right now this this king's son who is supposed to take over this kingdom okay the bible says this king he sacrificed that son so that there can be power that he can receive to defeat the people of god now look at this you know what he sacrificed he sacrificed his heir to the throne the guy who is supposed to rule on his stead he sacrificed that guy so the enemy will go to whatever extent to make sure that you are destroyed so don't don't be surprised when somebody comes to you and says oh there is a witchcraft done against you or the or somebody has paid money to make sure that you know this doesn't it it happens it still very much happens because that is the blessing of god upon your life the bible says that haman had paid a lot of money he had promised to pay a lot of money so that the jews can be completely destroyed the next verse it says mordecai gave hatak this is the guy who assisted queen esther a copy of the decree issued in susa that called for the death of all the jews not one or two but all the jews he asked hatak the assistant to show it to esther and explain the situation to her see queen esther she became she became the queen because of mordecai's efforts but right now mordecai doesn't have access to the queen now queen esther is no longer just a cousin of mordecai she is not just an adopted daughter to mordecai now she is the queen of the nation see there was a season when mordecai was like mentor to esther but in this season he has to follow protocols to reach esther now he cannot treat esther the way he would treat when esther was back home yeah. you understand back home he could just yell at esther talk to esther how he wants but now he has to follow the right protocol because right now he doesn't have access to the queen and and he has sent a word through the assistant through the eunuch who is serving this queen the next verse it says he also asked hatak to direct her to go to the king to beg for mercy and plead for her people now 
not only did Mordecai update Esther what is happening, but Mordecai also gave a direction. And he said, will you please go and tell Esther to go and beg for mercy, to, to ask uh, for the lives of the people of Israel or for the Jewish people to beg for the nation of Israel. Now, you know, it's, it's like a time where it's not easy for the queen to walk into the king's presence. You know the story, right? So I'm not going to go too much into it. And yet, the, the, this guy, Mordecai, the cousin of Esther and the person who actually adopted Esther into his family as his, as his daughter and took care of her, he is now giving a direction to Queen Esther saying, now you need to take this up into your hands and you need to go and plead before the king. You need to go and cry out before the king. Now, see, if you read the context, you would see that the book of Esther in the Bible is one of the only Bible, only books other than Song of Solomon's, which doesn't have any mention of God in it. If you read through the book of Esther, there is no mention or conversation about God. Primarily, I think the reason is because there's a lot of compromises that the book is built upon. The first compromise was that the people who are in Susa at this time, the Jewish people, they were not supposed to be in Susa. They were supposed to go back to Jerusalem. King Cyrus had already allowed the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and rebuild the, uh, the nation and all of that. And yet, these people, they stayed there. Why? Because things were very convenient. They've been in Babylon forever. They've been in this nation forever. And they have their homes, they have their children's education, they have their cars. Now, look at Jerusalem. Jerusalem is in ruins. Who wants to leave United States of America and come to United States of Hormagra? <laughs> Who wants to do that? You understand what I'm saying? That's exactly what these Jewish Jews did. Although the call of God for their life was to live in Jerusalem, was to head to Israel. That was the promised land, but, but they compromised there. They stayed away from there. And because of that, the Bible says, now Queen Esther, it was not allowed. Okay, if you read the previous chapter, the previous book, that is the book of Ezra you would see there is a, this massive repentance for people that are getting married to unbelievers. Men and women getting married between, you know, Jewish people getting married to non-Jewish people. Now, here is Queen Esther who is now married to a pagan king. Yes. See, one compromise led to a, another compromise that was bigger. So you, you would notice that God was not necessarily present in any of their negotiations. You, it was not because God spoke to them that, you know, they decided to, you know, stand in the beauty pageant or do whatever they did. You know, it was all based on their wisdom, their understanding. So, so you would not see God's presence being revealed here. And yet, there was, a, there was a season, there was this problem that came upon the people, upon the city, upon the Jewish people that are in Susa now, which is now pushing them to go and become desperate so that it can save their lives. Now they are going to plead for mercy. The Bible says that Mordecai, the guy who thought he knows how to now be well fed and well taken care of and what to do, all of that. Now he is looking for ways to save his own life. Now can I, can I say it like this? Can I say that the problems that push you into the presence of God, the problems that push you to depend on God, the problems that push you into the presence of the king, they are good problems? Yes. Sometimes it requires a death threat for some of us to realize the value of what God has given us. Sometimes it requires for a, a knife to be on our throat or a, or a bank uh, that, that will be behind our life to, you know, to uh, take back all of your property and everything so that you can come to realize that you need God. 
Sometimes we are, we are so confident. Oh, I have a salary. I have these people. I have my family. I have these things. We are so confident saying everything is, you know, under control. And that is why God in his divine mercy towards us. It is God's mercy for Esther. It is God's mercy for the people of Israel that God divinely allowed this problem that will push them out of their comfort zones. Now, Mordecai says, Esther, it's not enough that we, uh, we just take this lightly. Now you need to go to the presence of the king and you need to get out of your comfort zone and you need to make sure that we get mercy, that we get help. So then Esther, when, he, when she heard this message, the Bible says, verse 10, Esther told Hatak to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. What was this message? Anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter now who is this talking about the queen the queen necessarily is next in power to the king right although she doesn't have the political authority she is as valued as rich and as able as the king is and the bible says that she is afraid to go into the presence of the king because she knows unless i have an invitation i cannot go in this is serious business. Unless he allows me to come in, I am doomed to die. There is no good results out that will come out of this particular endeavor of me walking before, into the presence of the king. And in fact, she goes on to say, And the king has not called for me to come to him for, for how many days? 30 days the king has not called for me to come and the thing is this Esther didn't have a problem with that Esther didn't have an issue with the fact that the king has not called her for 30 days so now here is a problem that is now forcing her to go to the king do you understand what I'm trying to tell you this morning there are times when you can go on without a relationship with God for a long time. We'll, we know how to do church. We know how to do religion. We know how to just maintain, sustain whatever we are doing regularly. Just go from one meeting to the other. Go from one thing to the next. And, and, and in the process, miss out on the intensity of that intimacy that you're supposed to have with Jesus. And for 30 long days, you've not had an encounter with God. And you're okay with it. If somebody comes to you and says, wait, I need a word from the Lord. And you're like, oh, I haven't heard from the Lord for the last 30 days. And that doesn't disturb you. And that doesn't bother you. My friend, that has to make you go crazy. If you read the book of Song of Solomon, chapter 3 and verse 1, don't go there. I'm just sharing this. You can write it down. It says, one night... I laid down and my lover did not come. One night, one night. Okay, one night, not 20 nights, 30 nights. One night. The Bible says this lady, she laid, laid down and sh her lover did not come to see her. And she says she got up in the middle of the night when it was unsafe for this woman to be alone out in the public square. She goes out looking for her lover in the middle of the night she goes out looking to see where can i find my lover where can i find him how can i experience him one more time i cannot go to sleep tonight if i have not had an encounter with my lover I cannot go for 30 days without a visitation from the Lord. I cannot go for 30 days without experiencing this presence of God. I cannot go for another week without a touch from the Lord. People of God, if you have come to a place where you don't feel the need for God's presence, then I don't think you are in love with Him. Then I don't think you are desperate for His presence. Then I don't think that you are 
truly in that place where you're head over heels in love with your groom. If, you, if your heart doesn't break, if you're, if you're not able to, you know, just keep aside everything else for that one thing that is the presence of God that you miss, that you're not able to experience, I'm telling you there is some problem in your relationship with God. I'm saying this even to myself. I'm not like pinpointing any of you here. I'm even saying this to myself. That if, if, I can, if I can come here and preach a sermon and not feel the presence of God, if I can just do life from Monday to Saturday, it's help people, counsel people, minister to people, pray for people, do all of that without having personal encounters with God myself. I'm telling you, I'm a loser. I've lost the whole focus of my life. The presence of God has to be that priority in our lives where we cannot go for a day, a week, a month without having an encounter with this lover. So friends, I'm telling you, this, this season, this series, it's, it's not for us to just go back home feeling, wow, what a sermon. It is to make you feel uncomfortable and say, hey, get out of your comfort zone. Get out of the place where you are feeling satisfied, where you are happy with what you have. You are happy with what you are experiencing. You are happy with that little sermon. You are happy with that one, one, one tiny goosebump. No, we need more. We need more than what we had yesterday. We need more than what we had in our last season. We need to keep pushing for more. We need to keep asking for more. We need to keep desiring for more. The question I'm going to ask you is this. Where is your first love and longing when your bride, bridegroom's presence is not tangible? When your bridegroom's presence is not understandable? Where you cannot experience him? Where is your first love and longing? Can you go back and study Song of Solomon chapter 3 and, and study? I think our prophet Shaiju, he ministered from that during the October fasting prayer. One morning he, he shared it in detail. I want you to go back and watch that video if you can. Somebody find out that exact day and share it on the church group after the service is over. So that you can go back and watch it and, and, and meditate on Song of Solomon chapter 3. Where is your first love? Where is your initial longing for the presence of God? If you've lost it, then, then we are in a very dangerous place. Esther chapter 4 and verse 13. The Bible says, Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. So Mordecai is now trying to pinpoint at Esther and say, Esther, I know why you're happy. You're happy because your bills are paid. You're happy because you're living comfortably. You're happy because you think that nobody is going to hurt you in the palace. You're happy because you think that, you know, even if you don't have the king's presence with you, even if you don't have access to the king, it's okay. You have servants who is taking care of each and every one of your need. You think that nobody is going to touch you in the king's palace. But if you keep quiet, verse 14, at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. So what, what Mordecai is saying is that See, Esther, everything that you experience in this season, if you experience favor with the king, there is a generation of people outside this palace who is depending on you to carry that favor for them. But if you do not experience that favor, then God will find somebody else to bring those people to the Lord. God will find somebody else to meet those needs of this generation. So don't ever think that you are irreplaceable. Yes. Don't ever think that you are the only lover that Jesus has. Don't ever think that nobody else can take your place. If you think that, you know, nothing can happen without me in this kingdom, it's not like that. Just look back. There was a Queen Vashti just a few chapters before who got replaced. And it's that easy for God to raise up somebody else in your stead. 
if you don't do this don't think that the 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 favor will not come that the breakthrough will not come but you and your relatives they are going to die who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this as the you need to remember probably you became queen for a time like this there is the season that god was foreseeing in his foreknowledge that allowed god that allowed that that is why god allowed you to be here in the palace for a time like this but you need to understand that this time that we are in it is very significant that it is very important that you do not take it for granted you do not take one more day for granted you do not take another you do not wait for another 30 days to get there you have to you have to do it immediately this is the time now is the time now is the season now is the the day when you have to encounter god you cannot wait for the year end or for a time when there is going to be revival and there will be guest preachers or no 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 now is the time this is the season this season we need to get our priorities right we need to fall back in love with jesus unlike ever before we need to experience god we cannot go to the next series without having an encounter with god we cannot go to the next season of our life without having an encounter with god now is the time now is the season see being sensitive to the timings of god in your life is very key to your breakthrough if you want to experience the breakthrough sometimes it's not because you don't know the keys and the answers it's because you waited too long to execute those keys and those answers and then you're wondering why is it not working because there was an element of time there was an element of time see the bible says they tried killing jesus and 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 the enemy would be thinking wait why is it not working jesus came to die but why is it not working because the wrong timing at the right time it shall work at the right time if you use the right key it will work so being sensitive to the timings of god to the seasons when god wants to encounter you that is very very important and if you will miss that you'll have to wait for another 100000 years to receive that one encounter that god was waiting to give you can you imagine what would have happened last sunday we were talking about these two guys walking to emmaus right yeah. what would have happened if after receiving a nice bible study they would have said thank you friend thank you brother for that amazing bible study here is an offering enjoy go on they would have missed their encounter with jesus but the bible says they said no 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 it's in fact one translation says they forced jesus to come home they forced jesus to come home and that is where they had their encounter that is where their eyes got opened that is where they received that encounter with jesus so some of us we need to become intentional and say no i'm not going to miss my opportunity i'm not going to miss what god is doing right now i'm not going to miss this season i'm going to intentionally pursue god in this season the bible says then as soon as esther understood this the bible says esther sent this reply to mordecai saying now this is what i want you to do for me go and gather all the jews of susa and you need to fast for me do not eat or drink for 3 days night or day for 3 days don't eat or drink just fast and pray for me what what happens when you fast and pray why is it necessary that you would fast and pray see the fasting and prayer mind you was not so that the people of israel will be rescued Do you remember what Mordecai said if you don't do it somebody else will do it don't worry about it being only your job god knows how to rescue his people if you don't do it god will find another way but she's saying you need to fast for me cuz i have lost my intimate relationship for the last 30 days 
You need to fast for me because I want to get back into that place of intimacy. I want to get back before the presence of my bridegroom, before my king. I want to go back into that place, into the inner courts of the king. I want to get back there. So will you fast and pray for me? And what I'm going to do is, me and my maids here, we will also do the exact same thing. And then, even though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. And then she says this. She says, and if I must die, I must die. It's okay. If I should lose this relationship, I should lose this relationship. If I should lose this job, it is okay. I, I, I don't mind losing this job. If I should lose this contract, this business, this client, it's okay. It's not worth it. If I must perish, I must perish. It's not a problem. I am still going to do it because I know this is my time. And I know that I have to, have to encounter my king. And I know that I, I have to, have to go into the presence of God in this season. So can I, can I declare this over you? And I hope that you would receive this. God is looking for a bride that will put everything. Somebody scream everything. everything. God is looking for a bride that will put everything on the line to pursue his tangible presence. To pursue that tangible touch. To pursue the tangible presence of God. And she says, hey, I'm willing to fast and I'm willing to pray. And I need you all to fast and pray along with me, for me, for my relationship with my king. I want to see my king one more time. I want to see his face. I want to talk to him. I want to have a relationship with him one more time. So I want you to fast and pray with me. See, if you go into the New Testament... You would hear of this woman called Anna in Luke chapter 2 and verse 36. Have you heard of her? This story usually doesn't crop up during our Christmas times, but this is around Christmas. Eight days from Christmas. Eight days from when Jesus was born. That's when this incident is happening. The Bible talks about a prophet called Simon who, who the Lord had told him that unless you... See Jesus, you're not going to die. Can you imagine? God told him in a season when there was no prophecies, no revelations, nothing. For 400 years, no books of the Bible being written. God told Simon, unless you see Jesus, you're not going to die. So, as long as he was alive, he would keep telling everybody, saying, Hey, I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to see a revival in my generation. I'm going to experience the presence of God. I am going to see God with us. That is Emmanuel. That was what they named Jesus. Right? I'm going to see Emmanuel. I'm going to experience Emmanuel in my generation. He would keep talking about it to everybody all through his life. And finally, one day, lo and behold, Jesus is in the temple. Why? For what? Jesus is getting dedicated in the temple. The Bible says... Anything that opens the womb, the first fruit, always belongs to the Lord. That is why we usually bring our first salaries or our first promotion amount or whatever it is that our first, we bring it to the Lord. Why? Because our first fruits belong to the Lord. And, and you would see Joseph and Mary did the same. They brought Jesus to the temple to dedicate him to the Lord. And as this conversation was going on, Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. Now let's read about her. It says, she was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher. And she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. So let's, let's try to calculate her age, okay? It says that when, her, when she was married for only seven years, her husband died. So that should be around 20... 7, 28, in those days, they used to marry early. So maximum 27, 28, or let's say 30, round figure. It says, verse 37, Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. Okay, what did she do? Since that age, from 27, 28 to 84, 
What did she do? She never, the Bible says she never left the temple. You know why? Because there was this guy who was saying, we're going to see revival, we're going to see Jesus. And she said, okay, I'm here. I'm waiting. If, if, if I'm going to see that presence of God, if I'm going to encounter that presence of God, I'm not going, I'm not leaving till I experience that presence of God. Till I see that Jesus, I'm not leaving this temple. So for the next 54, 56, 57 years, she was waiting in the temple for one tiny encounter with the face of Jesus. You know, we get tired in 15 minutes. Nothing is happening. And we, we give up. And here is a woman for 54 years. Come on, Anna, don't you want to have a normal life like everybody else? Don't you want to enjoy life? Don't you want to go eat some chicken biryani out there? You know, let's read, let's read. It says, she, not only did she not leave the temple, but she stayed there, what? Do you remember day and night in Esther's story? What is what the story? Fast and pray for day and night. And here, this lady, day and night, she was worshipping God with fasting and prayer. Day and night, she is fasting. Day and night, she is praying. That fasting and praying became such a consistent pattern of her life that that became worship. So it was not just a one-off incident. That became the lifestyle. It says she was worshipping God through fasting and prayer. Can you imagine your, your fasting and prayer reach a place where it becomes worship? See, usually the fasting and prayer we do is not worship. The fasting and prayer we do is like a initial deposit we are paying so that we can get the house. So we can get the, uh, you know, the down payment that we give. So we'll fast and pray for three days so we get that sudden breakthrough and then remaining we'll pay in installments every morning, evening. But here, this lady, she is fasting and praying till it becomes her lifestyle where it becomes a sweet smelling aroma to God. She says daily she's just fasting and praying morning and night for 54 long years. Wow. I don't think anybody would have done anything like this. Because everybody else, even a man of God, would have to step out to preach, to do a lot of things. But here was this woman who was so in love with the presence of God. She said, I'm going to live a fasted lifestyle. I'm going to fast from everything that is, you know, enjoyable, pleasurable, normal for all of you guys. It's okay. I'll skip. I want to be here in the presence of God. I'm just going to just go after the presence of God. Then this is my whole soul aim in life. I want to encounter God's presence. So fasting and prayer is a form of worship. And thus, it is also a key to host His presence. When you fast and when you pray, just like worship is a key. You remember we talked about worship couple of weeks back, uh, when we sing song Tahila, when we release Tahila, the Lord, He is inhabiting the praises of His people. In the same way, when we fast and pray, that becomes a key and a, and a, and a way to enter into the presence of God, to host the presence of God, to host the, the greatness, the power, the might of God. And Anna would do the same. It says in verse 38, she came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph and she began praising God. She's like, this is the moment I was waiting for. She began thanking God. As soon as she heard that this is the child that Simeon was waiting for. In, in other words, she's had a previous conversation with Simeon about this. Because Simeon would have told her that I'm waiting for the Messiah to come. And as soon as she came and she overheard the conversation, she began praising God. She began worshipping. And then it says, and not only did she praise God, now she begins to talk to the people around her. It says, she talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting at spirit.
expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. So, the one reason why many of the religious leaders in the days of Jesus did not recognize Jesus was not because God was not moving, was not because God was not there, but because they were not looking, they were not eagerly expecting for God right now. Here was one lady who was earnestly waiting for revival, earnestly waiting for this move of God, earnestly waiting for an encounter with the face of Jesus. And the Bible says, she, as soon as she saw this, she experienced this, she began going and talking about him to everybody. This is the person who is going to rescue our nation. This is the person who is going to bring freedom. This is the person who is going to help us to get out of sin. This is the person, this is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the whole world. This is the light of the world. This is the, this is the bread of life that is given for your food and my food. Now, that fasting, that season of fasting that prepared her to be a prophetic voice among, her, you know, among her people group about what is going to happen in, in Israel in the days to come. See, not only did she get prepared to receive that encounter with Jesus, she got also prepared to bring this encounter with Jesus to others. Now, not only is she seeing Jesus, now she is representing Jesus to others. Do you see what is happening here? And all of that happened because this lady, 54 years, you may think that God does not notice your sacrifices. God does not notice how long you have had to wait and what all you've had to go through. I'm telling you, God does. If I was in Anna's place or if I was around her, I would ask her this question. Man, do you really think that God loves you? Your husband died when you were just married for seven years. That's, that's premature. That, that's not a good marriage. I don't think God loves you, man. I don't think that God cares for you. But this lady, she would stay in the temple. She would not even leave the temple because she has a promise. Because it's not even her promise. <laughs> her pastor or her leader, somebody else heard from God. That you will not die before you see Jesus. And she's like, is that true? Then I'm going to stay close to this guy. I'm going to go wherever this guy goes. Because if he has a promise of God over his life, and I stick close to this guy, I know that I can experience the same promise of God that is upon this guy's life. And so day and night, see, she's not from the tribe of Levi. You Remember what tribe is she from? The people in the temple usually are from the tribe of Levi and if they have to serve, they are from the descendants of Aaron. So this lady is not allowed to serve in the church. So she is not here because she has a job or she is paid to do what she is doing. See, the Levites, they get taken care of by the rest of the 11 tribes because they bring their tithes to the Levites. What is this lady living on? For 54, 56 years, she's just waiting there to encounter somebody else's revelation and promise that God has given them. She's just staying close to that person and saying, I want to experience the same Jesus. I want to experience the same God. I want to experience the same relationship that you have. I don't care how long I have to wait. I'm going to be right here. I'm going to stay rooted in this place. I'm, I'm not leaving this temple I know that God is coming. I know that God is revealing himself. I know and I know and I know that that if I just stay long enough, I can experience what you have been experiencing, what you have been hearing, what you have a revelation about. Can we skip and go a little more further? This during the days of Jesus. Mark chapter 2 and verse 18. It says, Once when John's disciples... And the Pharisees were fasting. So, do you know that John's disciples, John the Baptist? How many of you know John the Baptist? Yeah? Cousin of Jesus. Mary and Elizabeth, they were cousins. And now Jesus and John the Baptist, cousins too. Third, fourth cousins, don't know the relationship, but they were cousins some way or the other. The Bible says that people, they would have, see a contrast between Jesus and John. Because... John came fasting 
John had a fasted lifestyle. He would live in the wilderness. 30 years he lived in the wilderness. From the time that he was a boy till the time he was ready to preach, he lived in the wilderness all alone without any public interaction. Talk about that. Talk about a scarred childhood. Talk about an incomplete childhood. Talk about a child who didn't get to enjoy life like everybody else did. That's John, a fasted lifestyle. He had, he had, had a fasted lifestyle. It says that John's disciples, the disciples that followed John, they also had the same fasted lifestyle, a lifestyle of fasting like John did. So once when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, you know, Pharisees, if they are fasting, everybody in the city would know they are fasting. Did you, have you read about that? Jesus said, when you fast, don't fast like the Pharisees. Their fasting is just a show off because it's on Facebook, it's on Twitter. Just in case they missed, uh, you know, they will put two, three posts, one on Instagram stories, one on the feed, you know, everywhere to make sure that the whole world knows that they are fasting, right? It says when all of these guys were fasting, some people, they had some doubts. They came to Jesus and asked, Jesus, you, you seem to be this religious person. Why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples and like the Pharisees do? Now, they are, bring, they are questioning Jesus. Jesus, look at you. You're, you. you're living a luxurious life. You're living a lavish life. You're just going from... You know, one meeting to the another, being, you know, one day you are drinking water turned into wine, another day you are, you are dividing five loaves and, you know, two fish into thousands and you, you're having party every single day. But look at, look at the more religious people in our time, no? Look at them. They are fasting. They are, they are constantly in that place of, uh, you know, like torment, self-afflicted torment. Why is it that your guys, your disciples don't do the same thing? Why is it that they are not living a fasted lifestyle? And Jesus replied, this was Jesus' reply, very profound. This, 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 is the, this is the point. When this verse dropped into my spirit, I screamed. <laughs> I was like, oh no, this is, this, is what, this is what the Lord wanted me to share today. Jesus replied, do wedding guests fast while celebrating with the groom? No, of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them. Next verse, next line. It says, but someday, everybody says someday. someday. The timing is very important. That someday that groom will be taken away from them. And what will they do? And then they will fast. Why? Because that fast, that the lifestyle of fasting that opens keys for you to connect back to the groom. Jesus says, when the groom is with you, you don't need to fast. Then you enjoy revival. When the groom is in the house, when you're experiencing the tangible presence of Jesus. You know, Esther did not fast when the king came into her, 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 her coach. When the king came, you, you know the story, come on. What did she do? She arranged a lavish dinner. That was not the time for fasting. Yeah. But there was a time when the groom was not visiting her for 30 days. And she said, no, no, no. Now I, I, cannot, just, I cannot just live ordinary life. Now I need to fast. Now I need to break my heart. Now I need to rend my clothes, rend everything off of me. I need to fast. And, and the same thing you'd see Jesus telling the disciples... Jesus teaching the guys who were questioning about the disciples saying, these guys, they're enjoying now, but there's going to come a time when these guys are also going to fast. Right now is not their time to fast. Right now is their time to enjoy with me. But there's going to come a day when they don't have that physical relationship with me the way that they have today. And then they will also have to fast. And then they will also have to go deep into seeking in mourning, in crying, in desperate desire for a new thing. And Jesus, you know, explained something. But before, fasting is the natural response to the absence of God's presence. Can I encourage you to do this? If you don't feel God's presence for one day, declare a fast on the next day. 
don't wait for 30 days don't wait for 54 years if you don't experience one encounter if you if you go through one day without being able to read the bible or if you read the bible and god doesn't speak to you immediately go on a fast switch off your phone if necessary stop eating food if necessary do whatever it takes but go on a fast because it has to be our natural response to the absence of god's presence when we don't experience god's presence when we cannot host his presence and, and Jesus would say this in the next verse. And the reason I believe this is about fasting is because in the book of Matthew and in the book of Luke, whenever the same incident happened, Jesus said the exact same thing and word to word it is recorded. So I believe that what Jesus was saying is about fasting. And it says, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth leaving an even bigger tear than before so what jesus is saying is hey hey wait 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 there is going to come a time when the bridegroom is taken away and then they're going to fast and what would happen as a result of that fasting is that it is a it is a time when the old cloth is taken away and the new is added the, see, the old and the new cannot go hand in hand. So the old has to be torn away or taken away before the new gets added or the new gets, you know, stitched. And, and what Jesus is saying is, hey, fasting, this fasting is the key to get rid of the old and to tune in to the new. It's not like you did not have clothes till yesterday. So it's not like you did not have the presence of God till yesterday. But if you want a new dimension of God's presence in the next season of your life, then you need to go on a fast. If you're not satisfied with where you are right now, then go on a fast. You may already be hearing uh, from the Lord and you've been experiencing the presence of God and you've been walking with all of that. Praise God. But you're not satisfied. You want more then you go on a fast. Because you do not stitch the old with the new. God doesn't stitch the old with the new. Every season, when seasons change, there has to be a break. There has to be something. And, Je and Jesus says, hey, fasting, my disciples fasting when the groom is not around, that is going to be a sign that something new is being added and the old is being removed. And it says, Verse 22, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the new wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. Friends, let me declare this over you. When you fast and pray, you receive new wineskins. When you fast and pray, you receive a new mantle, a new clothing, a new ability to host the presence of God in the next season of your life. Amen. That is the power of fasting. That is what Jesus did. It says in, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 1, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, he returned from the Jordan River and he was led by the Holy Spirit in the wilderness. Verse 2, where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. But Jesus, he ate nothing and became nothing. All that time, he did not eat anything and he became very hungry, the Bible says. So for 40 days, Jesus did not eat. For 40 days, Jesus fasted and he prayed. For 40 days, Jesus depended on the presence of God. Why? Because now Jesus is about to enter into the next level of his hosting God's presence. See, verse 1 will tell you that he was already full of the Holy Spirit. Does somebody who is full of the Holy Spirit need to fast? Come on now. Can you be any more full than, you know, how full Jesus was? And the Bible says Jesus went on a fast because he knew that it's time to carry the next mantle. 
It's time to carry the new wine. This new wine and this new piece of cloth, I cannot carry it with the old cloth together. No, no, no. Now I need to rend the old cloth. Now I need to break the old wine skin. I need to break the old bottle. I need to disconnect from the old so that I can receive something new in this season. And you would see in verse 14, when the 40 days were done, Jesus returned to Galilee, this time not with just filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he has the Holy Spirit's power. See, you see, earlier he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he was filled with the Holy Spirit's power. They're two different things, by the way. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit, but not have the power of the Holy Spirit. And here he is, fasted for 40 days. And now he is returning. How? With the new wine, with the new cloth. Not because the previous one was not enough. He could have still made it, you know, he could have still worked with the previous fullness of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus fasted, saying, no, I need more. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, there's always more. more. Look at your other neighbor and say, there's always more. more. So if you hunger, if you seek, you will receive that more. There's always new cloth, new wine that the Lord wants to give you. If you're hungry, there's always more. Amen? Amen. And you will, this season, can I, can I say this out? Can I, this is not for everybody, but per- perhaps if you've been receiving from me and you are somebody under my covering, I will encourage you for the next seven days, can you go on a fast? Count from tomorrow till the next Sunday. Okay, seven days, Monday to Sunday, seven days. I heard it as an instruction from the Lord this morning and I'm releasing it to you. From 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Can you fast? 12 hours every day. You can eat before 7 or after 7, but 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. from tomorrow till the next Sunday. See, some of you guys may be watching us online on a later date or a later time or whichever time you listen to us on podcast, can you start the next day from whenever you hear us? The next day, whichever day you finish hearing us from the next day, you start your fast. 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. for seven days. We're going to pursue God's presence like never before. Because we are going to go from just being full of the Holy Spirit to now even enjoying and experiencing and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on now. This is the time. This is the season. I told you this. This is the time. We should not skip what the Lord is doing, what the Lord is speaking, what the Lord is releasing. This is the time for us to draw near like never before. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 21. Some of the disciples came to Jesus and said, why is this not happening? And Jesus said, hey, this kind of demons, they won't leave except for prayer and fasting when you fast when you when you go into that intense mode of disconnecting from your flesh see when i say fasting it may mean different for different people it's okay you can define what do you need to fast from for some of you it may be sweets that you need to fast from some for some of you it may be food you need to fast from whatever it is but for the next seven days fast at least from food okay but after that you can decide but Some of you, it may be your phones you need to fast from. Some of you, it may be your work that you may need to fast from. Some of you, you, it may be those things that is making you comfortable, that is making you, making your life easy, that you need to fast from. But whatever those areas are, when you fast from those, the Lord is now going to give you divine authority in this season. There are demons that you couldn't have authority over in the last season that you're going to have authority over in the next season. There are things that did not, they were not scared of you in the last season. They're going to become scared of you in the next season. There were things that were not possible. It was not possible for you to go into the presence of the king and receive favor in the last season. But in this season, you're going to be able to do that. You know, can I, can I, can I add a little bit of humor here? When you're a person that is going to fast and pray, the people around you will also begin to fast. Let me give you the example. The book of Daniel chapter 6 and verse 18. You know that Daniel was a man of fasting and praying and depending on God. It says, the king 
The king had no relationship with Daniel except the fact that Daniel worked for the king. It says the king returned to his palace and what did he do? And he spent the whole night fasting. The, the king is not fasting because he wanted an encounter with God. The king is fasting because he had an encounter with Daniel. He just met Daniel and he saw the conviction that was upon Daniel. And that pushed the king out of his comfort zone. So, dear prophet Anna, can I tell you this? See, when you fast and pray, you will have the ability to speak into somebody else's lives. And they will be able to fast and pray. Like John, when he fasted and prayed, his disciples fasted and prayed. And here is a Daniel who fasted and prayed. And the Bible says the king... He could not eat all night. He, it's not like he didn't want to. He couldn't eat all night. He fasted. And it says, and he even refused his usual entertainment. So the king refused to go on Instagram that day. The king is like, man, I, I, I can't take it today. I can't take it. I, I need to go on a fast. I just met Daniel. And I need to know what is the secret. And the king goes on to a fast to know the secret behind Daniel's lifestyle. Why is it that Daniel is not afraid of his life? That he is willing to put his life on the line to pursue this God. You remember what I told you some time back. God is looking for a bride who is willing to put everything on the line to pursue God's tangible presence. And here was a king who saw this Daniel. And the king, the Bible says, the king goes on a fast and he says, No more entertainment for me. I'm just going to be here. Just leave me alone. All my attendants, all my comedians, all the dancers, all the social media, television, switch everything off. No more entertainment. I need to encounter the God of Daniel. And you would see that the chapter finishes with that, where he writes a proclamation to the whole world, the whole known world, saying the God of Daniel is the real God. Why? Because he was inspired to fast after he met Daniel. And that will be your story, my friend. Yeah. That, the, that the people that are around you, that are watching you, that are even the ones responsible for you to be thrown into the lines, then they will go into fasting because of seeing your fasted lifestyle. Because of the authority that you carry in this season of life. Can I make it a little more interesting? The next verse says, <laughs> My God sent his angel... And shut the lions. Now the lions are also fasting. <laughs> See, again, the lions, it's not like they, they're not hungry. If you read the next verse, you would see that they ate up all the guys that put Daniel in the lions then. They're not just the guys, their families, their children, whole, they pounced upon them and they devoured. They were hungry. But they had to fast because there was a fasted man that walked into their den. So can I speak to some of the lions that you're facing in this season? That those, those lions are going to fast in front of you. That those lions are going to, their mouths are going to be shut by the Lord. The Lord is going to divinely shut their mouths. They will not be able to devour what belongs to you. They will not be able to touch what belongs to you. The Lord is calling his bride. See, I don't want you to fast. Listen, listen to me carefully. I don't want you to fast so that you can shut the mouth of the lion. I don't want you to fast so that you can cause the king to fast. I don't want you to fast so that you can have this authority over demons. I want you to fast so that you can have that intimacy with your king once again. And when you experience that intimacy with the king, automatically, as a natural result, you will have authority. As a natural result, the king and the queen that are surrounding you, all the people that are surrounding you, that the disciples that are looking up to you, or the, or the boss that is putting you in that position of problem, they will begin to fast. They, their lives will become uncomfortable. 
that the lions that are there to devour you whose assignment is to eat you up whose assignment is to kill you those lions will begin to fast for your sake my friend because this is a special season for us to fast this is a special season for us to seek and pursue and go after the presence of god thank you for downloading today's sermon we hope this ministered to you and your family today connect with us at dreamingrevival.com and you're welcome to join in to any of our sunday celebration service at 11 am or you can tune in to our live stream at youtube.com/pastorpriji God bless you and have a blessed week.